So while we've covered a lot of stuff in this class, I just want to do a quick skim over how a general boot should work because it'll show you how much other stuff there really is to still know. So to that end, there's a nice document called the Intel Minimal Architecture Bootloader. And I highly recommend you go check this out after this video because it gives you a sense of all the other stuff that we didn't cover in this class. So let's, you know, see what we covered and what we didn't. Well, it says that, you know, you have to power up and you have, you know, their 16-bit real mode code starting at the reset vector. Great, we covered that. And then there's sort of an operating mode transition. So it may transition from real mode to protected mode. If it was a super legacy BIOS, it might just stick around in real mode for a long time. But for any modern BIOS, we would expect it to transition from real mode to protected mode. And we saw that as well. Then there's something like CPU microcode updates. Well, we didn't talk about that at all, right? This microcode is a mechanism that uh, Intel CPU can use to kind of change the sort of micro operations that occur behind the scenes. We know that these Intel instructions are extremely complex, and so they're generally made up of a bunch of smaller sub micro instructions, and that's what the microcode is. And so the BIOS, the firmware, is responsible for updating the microcode at boot time because if there's any sort of errata or fixes or anything like that, you want to make sure that those are applied as soon as humanly possible so that you don't screw up the rest of your boot. Then there's things like setting up the CPU for cache as RAM or CAR. Uh, at such time as you see the code transitioning to what you would consider traditional C code compiled by a normal compiler, you can only do that if you have something like a stack, right? So a C compiler can assume that you have a stack. Well, if you're just executing directly off the flash chip, you don't have a stack. You can't just read and write directly to the flash chip. We saw the elaborate mechanism using the spy registers in order to write to the flash chip. So cache as RAM is a nice sort of workaround where basically the CPU cache, which is trivially read writable, is modified to act as if it was RAM. And then you set the instruction pointer into that area so that, you know, it can just operate like a stack. Then there's uh, chipset initialization for things like the PCI X bar for memory mapped I.O. There's also still a thing called the MCH bar, even on you know, modern PCH systems. Then the processor moves on to memory initialization, which is setting up the memory controller itself. Oh, hello. All right, so then uh, after you have the memory controller initialized and so you can nominally access RAM, uh, potentially want to do a memory test. This is something you might see if you, you know, boot a server, you'll often see it taking forever to do a memory test because they have like a ton of memory. And then uh, firmware would typically want to copy from the spy flash chip out to RAM because this is just a faster, faster place to execute from, right? This execute in place from the flash is very slow. You're continuously fetching assembly instructions from this, you know, 66 megahertz bus or whatever. And so in the document, they call it firmware shadowing. And so you want to copy it as soon as possible into memory. There's other things like memory transaction redirection, the PAM registers. This has to do with uh, some certain low address space ranges can be you know, redirected from memory to hardware. Then they're setting up the normal stack, which actually points into normal DRAM. And then you transition from executing in place out of flash to this copy of uh, firmware that you've loaded into RAM. There's a bunch of miscellaneous platform enabling, which is going to be dependent on the particular platform. And that's why, you know, uh, Intel creates those documents called the, the, you know, whatever Skylake BIOS writer's guide, that kind of thing that tells people running on a Skylake system, you know, what they have to do to set up, you know, clocks and set up, you know, general purpose IO. Then there's interrupt enabling the programmable interrupt controller, local advanced programmable interrupt controller, IO advanced programmable interrupt controller. And so if it was something like a legacy BIOS, they might set up the interrupt vector table. Uh, that was what's used for legacy BIOS to do things like reads and writes from the hard drive to read the master boot record. Or, you know, if it's going to be more of a protected mode code execution, they might set up the interrupt descriptor table. That is the same sort of thing we learned about in architecture 2001. Then the firmware might want to do things like setting up timers, the you know real-time clock, the programmable interrupt timer, the Tico timer, using it as a watchdog. This can be, you know, watchdog would be, for instance, to know that like if this thing took too long to boot, then it would just sort of stop and restart. And, you know, maybe something went wrong. Maybe it was a transient error. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe they set something in, you know, the RTC, the, the CMOS, in order to, you know, keep track of how many failures there were to you know, halt or do some alternate boot path if, you know, it was failing over and over again. So the timers can be used for a lot of different things.
Then there's the memory cache control, which is important if you want to actually boot fast. If you ever, you know, screw with these and don't set them up at boot time, you will see that cache is very important. You boot super, super slow if you don't have that. And, you know, we saw MTRRs a little bit in the context of SMRRs as a, you know, way the MTRRs were modified for an attack on SMM and SMRRs are the thing that would also have to be set up to change the caching behavior for SMM. At some point in boot, the processor is going to have to figure out what kind of processor it's running on, how many cores it has, that kind of thing, because at, up to this point, it's actually operating on a single core, the bootstrap processor. And so at a certain point, it, provide, uh, it issues the startup interprocessor interrupts, and these are actually going to be sent to other cores. So you're running single core up to a point, and then if you'd like to wake up the other cores and tell them to run some particular code, then you use Zippy's startup interprocessor interrupts in order to wake up other cores and get them running. They're gonna all start in real mode, and so they might transition in protective mode. They right, might just, you know, spin and wait. You know, it depends on whether you expect your firmware to actually be uh, multi-core supporting or whether you're just gonna run a single core until you get up to a bootloader. Then the firmware might need to start setting up a bunch of, you know, I.O. devices, your peripherals, your embedded controllers, super I.O., USB, SATA, etc. So, you know, start interacting with both built-in and external devices. Then PCI discovery occurs for things that, you know, might not be built in, might not have, you know, hard-coded ways of discovering them. Something that was just, you know, slotted into a particular PC. So, you know, enumerate all the devices, check whether or not they need, you know, port IO or memory mapped IO bars filled in, check whether or not they have option ROMs that need to be executed to fully configure them. Then the firmware has to play that memory map Tetris in order to set up things like general memory, reserve memory, eCPI reclaim, that's some stuff that's used for the power management which can be reclaimed and reused later on by the OS, versus eCPI NVS, the non-volatile storage, this is the stuff that was supposed to be reserved. This is that area that, you know, the uh, S3 resume scripts used to get stuck into and just, you know, were trivially rewritable because there's nothing special or protected about this. So getting up all these sort of memory regions to start interacting with and convey information to uh, operating systems, bootloaders, et cetera. And of course, avoiding any you know, special reserved regions or setting up any special reserved regions, which again, depends on the processor. Finally, toward the end, there might be you know, interactions with non-volatile storage, be it the sort of legacy CMOS, which only gives you a little bit of memory, or you know, non-volatile spy flash. So especially UEFI systems are generally going to make uh, extreme use of, you know, non-volatile EFI variables, right? But really anything, you know, legacy BIOS, core boot, etc. just, you know, the spy flash is there, and so they can choose to have some convention by which they store information there. Finally, this is sort of the end of the firmware. It'll now say it's time to hand off to a bootloader. So it's just so simple, right? 16 steps, which is so easy to summarize and super not easy to implement. And, you know, what's an interesting thing that's left out of this Intel document? Well, there's no mention of security, right? There's no, you know, quick start guide of, you know, the bare minimum security stuff you gotta do. So there's nothing about initializing SMM or locking it down, et cetera. So that guide is interesting, and, you know, I think you should definitely go read it. Uh, the general point is a lot of that stuff we talked about is not necessarily or not theoretically or not as we, far as we know security relevant, but that's where the research lies, right? Often going in and investigating these things that today no one thinks is security relevant really understanding it, looking at it with an attacker's perspective, and then, you know, you might find some new research applicable uh, way of compromising the system. So how do you learn about all of that different stuff? Well, you can go read the Intel guide and they have pointers to a bunch of specifications and so forth. You could go read something like, you know, open source, Tiano Core, uh, UEFI reference code, or Core Boot. You can sign the NDAs with Intel or find the leaked BIOS writer's guide and read those other, you know, hundreds of pages of documentation. Lots of it dry, and again, most of it not seemingly security relevant. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's different ways to understand all of this. And as I said, checking it out, finding this is going to be, you know, potential areas for fruitful research. There are things that people don't think is security relevant today. If you, you know, put an attacker's eye on it, it could be tomorrow.